Welcome back. Our next guest has a new book. It's called When the Dogwoods Bloom, and it is spring right now, and everything is in bloom. I happen to live in dogwood and cherry blossom neighborhoods, so they are running rampant here, and I'm so excited to introduce you to Victor Troidel, who grew up all over the world. He was an army brat. He moved a lot. He has a whole world of stories to tell and somehow ended up with a life in technology. So after a career in technology and a lot of passion around wildlife and nature photography, Vic is here with this amazing book and he's going to tell us first, Vic, hi. Thank you for joining us and tell us a little bit about you. How did you get to here? Sure, uh, you know, I, I guess I grew up as a storyteller for some reason. Um, but I never had any kind of a right, you know, passion for writing. Um, I wanted to be uh, a photographer, honestly. Um, I grew up, one of my father's stations while I was growing up was in Germany. Um, I actually spent six years there. So I tell people I grew up in Germany, um, but I, we spent six years there. Um, and I, it was just such a wonderful place to have a camera and take pictures of ancient camp castles and landscapes and things like that. And so I really enjoyed doing that. And that's what I wanted to do with my life. Um, when I got out of school, I tried to find a job in photography, had no luck. Uh, a friend of mine um, sent me to the computer store to buy him a floppy diskette. Uh, remember those days, um, it was a while ago, but to buy a floppy diskette for his class because he needed to be able to have it. He was taking a computer class. So I went to the computer store and I while I was buying the diskette, I asked them if I could have a job and they gave me a job and I got into technology. And my whole career was doing that. Um, I spent a number of years along the line working for the Walt Disney Company in technology. After Disney, I went into consulting and was traveling extensively on airplanes and continued, I guess, my life of as being an army brat where every three years I was up and moving somewhere else. And so it was all over the world all over the U.S. Um, experiencing life from different points of view. So you have actually written other books. You've written both fiction and nonfiction. What's so? What's the process? How do you actually yeah. talk about it? Yeah. Well, so what what got me into it, I guess, in a way, is an interesting story. Is is that it was during a, a difficult time in my life um, when I was going through a divorce and a custody battle, and my attorney told me to write everything down. So. I don't know, it was a few months later, I handed him a 500 page manuscript and he just started laughing at me. He says, you know what, how much this is gonna cost you for me to read this? Um, but I found that the process of writing down your thoughts and your feelings for me was very therapeutic. Um, and so I decided after that to write a novel. Um, the process of learning how to write took about five, well, it's taken my whole life, but I mean, it took me at least five years to write that first novel. Um, and it was very therapeutic. And I always thought, gosh, I'd love to, you know, make this a career, but there's not much money in it unless you have a big name and you can sell tons of books, but it was fun. It was a passion. And I continued doing that. And I wrote, so I wrote four other novels. Um, and then my wife, Gail, and I wrote a self-help book on relationships called Soulmates My Ass. Uh, and that that book was really just um, it was designed to be uh, well, we we had a we had a great relationship, continue to have a great relationship. And so it was written as a guide to help others who would always come to us and go, how come your relationship so good and ours is so bad? And it's like, well. So we as opposed to just having all those one-on-one -on -one sessions where we weren't getting paid for it, we said, well, we'll just write it down in a book. And so we wrote it in a book. Um, but that's that was that was kind of a passion of being able to help help people with their relationships because the world makes it hard. Um, you know, our society makes relationships hard. Of course, people make relationships hard, but it's not never easy. And so that's what we did. We wrote that book. And so so through the process, four novels. Uh, when I, when we retired, we were living in Florida and, you know, nobody retires to Florida if you already live in Florida. Good point. That's just, that's not, 
So we decided to move to the mountains and get away from the, the heat of Florida and the beach and all the tourists. And so we moved to the mountains, the Great Smoky Mountains of North Carolina. Um, which are a very beautiful, mystical, magical place. Um, and that's kind of where we came. And that gave me, re refueled my passion for photography, um, of doing landscape and wildlife photography that I really hadn't been doing since I got out of school. Um, and so I've gotten back into it, go hiking a lot, go up into the mountains, take my camera, take pictures. Um, then now kind of go all over the world taking pictures and it's just a lot of fun. So that was, that was a passion. Um, and it helped give me time and the energy to refuel that passion. It's been wonderful. And now you've got the mountains and the Appalachian Trail as great inspiration for this last novel or most recent novel, When yeah. the Dogwoods Bloom. So tell us how that came about. Yeah, so... So during retirement, one of the things is like we need to find something to do. So we decided to start hiking and we joined the local hiking club, the Nantahala Hiking Club. And the Nantahala Hiking Club turns out one of its main pretense of existing is to maintain a section of the Appalachian Trail. So the Appalachian Trail is 2,200 miles from Georgia to Maine. It's been around, uh, well, this is kind of itself an interesting story. It was conceptualized about 100 years ago um, and then finished in 1937. But in all reality, all they did was connect trails that had existed for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We don't really know how long those trails have existed. So they talk about the trail exists for 100 years, but it's literally, when you go hike sections of that trail, you are walking on trails that have probably been there at least 10 or 12,000 years, maybe 50, who knows, 50. Wow, well, I bet nobody knows that, or very few people. Don't, people don't understand that. And so, um, but the trails have existed. They were, uh, they were game trails, you know, because because the animals go through the forest, they find the easiest path. And so they always would go kind of the same way. And that's where it all started as game trails. The Native Americans used those game trails when they were hunting because that was the easiest place to find game. And so in where we are in North Carolina, um, they have dated back uh, archaeologically 12,000 years that Native Americans and primarily the Cherokee Indians were in this area. So for over 12,000 years, they've been hiking on those trails for sure. We know. Um, so anyway, I joined the Nantale Hiking Club. Their main pretense was maintenance of the trail, which is the entire 2,200 miles is maintained by volunteers. But after a year in tech or lifetime, a career in technology, I didn't feel that I had the physical ability to carry a chainsaw up the top of a mountain and cut down a tree. Um, and so when we joined the club, we became what we called trail ambassadors. And we just got to go out and talk to hikers. And it was quite easy. Just go out on your own time and go out and do that. And so that's how we joined the club. Um, then over the years, I definitely got into maintenance, got into better shape, which is funny. The older you get, the better shape you get. Um, started doing the maintenance, but then took over as the president of the club a couple of years ago. And so it's a great, the Appalachian Trail in itself is an amazing thing. Uh, and being able to ensure that the trails are passable is an important thing. And so... I think your question was referenced to how the, the concept of the book start um so i felt i wanted to write one more book um and the way the process works for me personally is i just start with a sentence almost a single sentence maybe a character maybe some idea of what's wrong or what's going on in that character's life and then just sit down and start writing and for me personally i write in a spiral notebook with a pen and I open it up and I write like crazy. And within a couple of hours, I can fill a whole hundred page notebook. Um, I can't read it when I'm done, but I can fill the whole thing up. Um, and for me, the learning of the process of writing, that was all about um, not editing while you're writing a story. And a lot of people, they'll sit down in front of their computer. And, we, and for me, it was the same thing. When you sit down in front of your computer to write, especially it's a story, you're going to spend more time editing as you go, as opposed to just getting the story. So for me, when the story comes, it just busts out of me and I have to just write like crazy. So I had 
an idea that I wanted to write a story about a man whose wife passes away and his dealing with the grief and getting on with life. Um, and so my wife, Gail and I, we were going to do a trip along the Blue Ridge Parkway, which is a from, it goes from the Great Smoky Mountain National Park in North Carolina, all the way up to the Shenandoah National Park in Virginia, uh, along the tops of the mountains and you drive it and there's the most amazing views in this country. Uh, 450 miles, we were gonna do it over a period of two weeks, drive about 50 miles a day, go up and hike, go um, do all kinds of stuff along the way. Um, and as we were getting started, I hadn't discussed this with my wife because she knows when I start writing, we end up getting a divorce for a year or so because I'm focused on that. She calls it my mistress. Um, but she knew, you know, she wasn't necessarily too excited, but I said, told her I wanted to write another one. I didn't tell her anything about it, but I said, I just need, I need character names. So for me, if I'm going to start writing and I have a character or something in mind, I need to name them. And sometimes that's hard. Um, and so we're driving through the Cherokee Reservation, which is the entrance of the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. And there's a sign, a street sign. It's T-S-A-L-I Boulevard. And she goes, that's a good name right there. Use that. And I was like, I don't even, can't even pronounce T-S-A-L-I. Um, we, I think we'd start off calling it Sally or Saul. We didn't know. So we stopped for breakfast. I pulled out my phone. I did a quick search on that name and I was amazed and blown away. So it's actually pronounced in Cherokee, Charlie. Charlotte Tolly was a real Cherokee Indian. He was born somewhere around 1776, 1777. So the beginning of the creation, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And he lived, lived an amazing life during a very difficult time as the, the Cherokee Indians and all Native American tribes went through a very difficult time as the Americans, Europeans um, continued to kind of encroach on their lands. And there were wars. There were all kinds of, all kinds of things that happened. So when I looked that up, I was just amazed and, and started doing more research on the local Cherokee history. Um, and the more research I did, the more amazed I was. And I decided to kind of incorporate a little bit into that, into that story. And at the beginning it was a little bit, and it just continued to grow over time. But originally, um, it just started maybe a paragraph here and there, and it turned into its own thing. And so, so the story is Charlie's wife passes away. He ends up on the Appalachian Trail because he's looking for answers. And the answers, easiest place to find answers around here is go to the top of a mountain and look out on God's creation. And so he ends up on the Appalachian Trail and he um, befriends a young woman who is doing a similar thing. She's trying to find herself. She's trying to find her own answers. And during that process, he starts telling her the history of his Cherokee ancestors, because he is part Cherokee. And he starts telling her the history, and it is a captivating and heartbreaking and an illuminating story, but he starts telling her the history of, the, of that. And that begins their adventure um, to find answers, to find ways to solve life. But for the people that hike the entire Appalachian Trail, a few thousand, a few million people hike parts of it every single year. But about two to three to two to three thousand every year hike attempt to hike the entire thing from Georgia all the way to Maine, twenty two hundred miles, which is equivalent to climbing Mount Everest sixteen times. So, few thousand do, few thousand do it uh, or try to do it. Literally, hundreds make it. It's a, it's challenging physically, but it's also challenging mentally. But the number one thing that the people that do accomplish it say is that it changed their lives. And, and so it's a place where people go to find answers, to find themselves, to find what's important in the world and to do things. And that's all kind of incorporated into the story of when the dog was.
And without giving away too much of the story, it is the ups and the downs and all the lessons that come both in survival and I would say rebirth, right? So something you can find in the mountains, in the woods. I want to talk about this amazing photograph because this is one of yours. And I know there's a story behind that as well. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, you know, the, the photograph is in in the, in the Great Smoky Mountains, when the dogwoods bloom, it's the beginning of spring. It's the beginning of rebirth. And literally it's fun to watch because for six months prior to that, five months prior, the forest just looks lifeless. The trees are gray. There's no leaves. It's just kind of a, a lifeless dead environment. And as the dogwoods start blooming and the process takes about a month from when you first see the bud until they really open up and it takes about a month. So starting at about the middle of March going to, for us to about the middle of April. Um, and so I started writing the book in 2019. It was done at the beginning of COVID. The world changed. We're all locked up in the house. And so I started a photography project that year of every day I was going to take my camera on the deck of our home, take a picture of the dogwood tree that hangs out over our deck with the mountains in the background. And the mountains that are silhouetted in the background are the mountains of the Appalachian Trail. And so it's where the Appalachian Trail goes along those mountains. And so every single day I did that. The beginning of it was just a sticky looking thing with little tiny, you couldn't even tell what it was, but some days were beautiful, some were stormy. Um, And so I did that for all the way through till April 18th. And this, the picture that's on the cover was April 18th when the blooms were full blown. It was a beautiful sky. Um, and that became the cover of the book. Um, but as with COVID is as is life, you know, there's ups and downs and you never know what tomorrow is going to be. And so, you know, I felt I had the book done. Um, at the beginning of COVID. It's funny, right? <laughs> yeah, COVID hit, every, the world shut down, and um, the whole publishing industry is based in New York City, and New York City, like everybody, just they, New York City shut down and everybody ran. Um, and so my opportunity to, to get it published was basically disappeared. And so I took the next three years and took it as a positive sign and spent the three years writing revisions and edits. And I went through 21 versions of the story. And each time I did more research, um, about the Cherokee, talked to more people, traveled to more places and saw these things. And the Cherokee story got larger and larger and larger to the point where the book is today. It just came out in March. Um, and so the pretense of the story goes along with when the dogwoods bloom is that the main character, Charlie, he took his wife on a hike every year to a place where there are lots of dogwood trees. And that was what she called her heaven. She could go up there. And it was a beautiful waterfall and surrounded with dogwood trees. And that was for her, you know, her own personal rebirth to, you know, to the things that were coming. And as soon as those dogwood trees bloom, the rest of the forest just explodes. The animals come to life, the trees come to life, and it just becomes a totally different world. And so it was really all about rebirth, um, recreation or a new opportunity to live your life and enjoy what it is about. Well, and as we launch into spring all over the country, the timing couldn't be more perfect. So let's just say the timing worked out exactly as it should. Vic, where can our viewers find you? Where can they find out more? And also where can they see some of those fabulous photographs that are behind you on the wall? Sure. Um, so the, the, um, the book website is whenthedogwoodsbloom.com. Um, there are some photographs on there, um, but it's more about the synopsis of the book and um, links to purchase the book. From It's on Amazon, um, and that's the best place. And there's also a link to my personal photography website so you can see some of the, some of the wildlife and, and uh, landscape photographs that I have taken over the, the years. Is, we'll post all the links and also include them in the blog post on the website. Vic, thank you so much for coming to join us. I know our viewers are going to want to know more about you and about when the dogwoods bloom. So I'll look forward to hearing from you again as we see where it all goes. Thanks for joining us. 
Thanks, Lauren. Thanks for having me. And we'll be right back.